So where I started, my original diagnosis was um, chronic acute panic disorder complicated by severe depression. Um, that was later revised to a simplified severe PTSD and addiction. Um, my original diagnosis was incurable. It was, I was diagnosed in a chronic state. And the original diagnosis was, of course, there were multiple reasons I was diagnosed this way. The first one was my age. I was 23 at the time. And so I was told my brain had fully formed and um, that I wouldn't be able to completely heal it, that I would suffer the condition my entire life. Now, they, we know a lot more about neuroplasticity in the brain now, but there are stu still two other conditions within that diagnosis that are still diagnosed the same way today. And that was my DNA and my experience. So I come from an environment where I was raised with psychopathic people and people with severe hyperactive disorders, uh, ADD, ADHD, um, extreme conditions. So uh, I was told my brain had bad wiring, that you're just DNA, it's just luck of the draw, you can't do anything about it, this is just how your brain function is. And the second thing was experience. I was told that I would uh, suffer my entire life uh, night terrors, panic attacks, things like that. My panic disorder was pretty acute. I was initially on MAOIs and it really did help me. It helped me. It actually made my life better. That's how bad I was. So um, I, but I had a hard time accepting the diagnosis that uh, I would suffer my entire life because of someone else's bad decisions in my mind. So I started looking around so where I am now is I'm cured. I test, I currently test as never having had any condition like that, that my brain is just healthy, high functioning. Um, and so I want to talk about how I did that and what I did. So what we're going to talk about tonight is the brain's relation to consciousness, the effect brain function has on us, where triggers really begin. We're going to learn what we can do to control it. You know what? I've got to do both of these. Wait, I don't. Give me one more second. Uh, we're going to do practices, live happier, healthier lives. I am going to do this because I can now. Sorry, I stopped casting because I thought that was what was ruining the live stream. Um, I want to make sure. Desktop. Desktop. And I'm just going to do this one. I'm going to stop casting this one. I stopped. That should show my guest call. Let me make sure this is off. It's all about technical difficulties today. But this is going to be easier. If I'm trying to go back and forth between the two, there are going to be. Here. Wow. Something is wanting to work for me. I feel like this is often the hardest part watching someone while they're learning. And you're like, she's done all the healing and learned all the things and is out there. And like, what's the hardest part of your practice? <laughs> there's so many times like, it's just oh, like then. clockwork you know yeah, like usually yeah. I don't have an issue and tonight I don't know everything is is being uncooperative so I have to worry about making sure that the video for people online is good so I'm just going to do both now because that's not working and then if there's a point where we have a break I'll go ahead and do that so we'll just do it this way for now and I'll do both because I'll put it there. I can do this. So, okay. So what we're going to talk about, where we're going to start is where triggers really begin. Um, now, this is really important. So when we're talking brain function, what I'm talking about is um, the result of, let me rephrase that, that our entire thoughts, feelings, emotion, our perception of ourselves. Our perception of the world around us are all byproduct of chemical. And so those chemicals are triggered in the brain. So you have these neurons that hold information 
um, certain things happen and it triggers the release of a chemical. And this is how we have our result. This is what we're going to be talking about a lot tonight. So we want to talk about how triggers work. So the first thing that is involved in a trigger is sensory information. So this is sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, right? And the ba brain's base desire in all things is to be safe, to live better, to have um, more life. That's the drive of all of nature. And so we're being a fundamental part of nature. This is what our brain is doing. So the sensory information, what happens is, is it combines with memory. Now, memory is stored data from the past. This can be your past, so your life experience. It can be ancestral past. So this can be include primal memory. Um, most people that are afraid of spiders, snakes, fear of the dark, all come from primal memories. If you take any primate that's never seen a snake before in its life and show it a snake, it will freak out, <laughs> right? This is just encoded in our DNA, but it is encoded as memory. So we have our personal life experience, we have our entire ancestry, and then we all, in, including all the way back to primal memory, and then we have the current environment. So the brain is storing all this memory as data, right? It combines that memory with sensory information. So basically, if we're talking about a trigger, for example, um, that's going to trigger me into a fight or flight response, I'll talk more about that my brain is going to store information that predicated that. So if somebody grabs me by the arm and then attacks me, my brain is going to store being grabbed by the arm because it's going to try and prevent the thing from happening, right? And then what it's going to do is it's going to, when that happens, it's going to release a chemical. So again, we have sensory information that connects with memory, whatever that memory is, good, bad, everything everything that happens to us, and then a chemical is released, okay? This is what becomes our sensory triggers. So when we're talking sensory triggers, this is what we're talking about. This is the this is what's driving the entire bus of our brain. <laughs> so um, what I want to do is not zoom that. I want to talk about the fact that sensory trigger then, combined, again, releases that chemical. This creates our state of consciousness, which then affects our life experience. So ultimately, this is what I was talking about. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, everything you consider your reality is byproduct of a chemical production. So what we're going to do is break down those chemical productions, break down the effect they have on our life experience, and then talk about ways to be able to control the brain function that releases that chemical. So we're going to start our process with understanding the brain's relation to consciousness. So consciousness for us is how we experience our reality. The first thing I want to talk about is the effect of threat of imminent death. So threat of imminent death doesn't necessarily mean someone's going to kill you. So this applies to the fact that if a tiger is chasing you, there is a threat of imminent death. Now, being primates, we have two other threats that are potentials, in fact, that are coded into our DNA that run us as much as seeing a snake does. And that is safety and familiarity, as well as um, social survival, right? So two things primates have to have. Primates are the weakest of all predators. And so in... Um, in that, there have been a couple of mechanisms that have been encoded into our systems to help try and keep us safe. So, so our brain is going to register that I have a threat of death first and if I'm losing anything socially. So this is why, like, if it's the end of a relationship, if we're not having the right social status, anything that's driven socially. Now, in the primate level, this just means tribe. We have to have enough of a tribe to feel safe. But in... Human development, this has now become the right car, the right job, the right kind of relationship, the right group, the right religion, the right um, political party, you name it, right? So these are all social tribes for us. So any threat of losing our social position becomes a threat of imminent death. The second one, safety and familiar familiarity. This is why a lot of people resist change. This is just a primal reaction of the brain. Because... Safety, we needed it. 
right? You had to know which berries to eat. You had to know who looked familiar. So you knew, so you knew who you could and couldn't trust, who you couldn't, couldn't feel safe around. You had to know what tribal boundaries were. All these things that we had to know as these systems were development, safety and familiarity, familiarity was huge. However, with seven and a half billion people on the planet, there is constant change. So we can't stay in what's familiar. So this has become a constant trigger for people, right? So when we talk about the trigger of threat of imminent death, we're not just talking about a tiger chasing us. Now the brain's gonna react like a tiger's chasing us, but this could be losing social standing or losing familiarity, having to go into something that we're not familiar with. And then what this does is this triggers the brain chemical norepinephrine. It also triggers epinephrine and histamine. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But the norepinephrine specifically is stored in the synaptic vesicles and released under fight or flight trigger. So that's the state of consciousness we're talking about is fight or flight. So this threat of imminent death triggers norepinephrine, which puts us in a fight or flight state. Now we have norepinephrine all the time. It's what makes us awake and alert and be able to focus and concentrate on things. But this is an additional release. Right? So you're getting extra norepinephrine in the system. And again, I'll talk chemicals more in a minute. And the resulting state of experience of life is suffering. Every single thing you would define in your life as suffering is the result of a fight or flight trigger. This means <coughs> if you're sad, if you're angry, if you're depressed, if you're frustrated, if you're... Um, sure. So if you, if you don't have motivation, emotional, mental, physical pain, all of these things are states of suffering and they're all the results of these triggers. I'm going to get a little bit more into that. So that's the first state of consciousness we, we're going to talk about within this session, but also is fundamental in what we do in the Inspired Evolution Project. So that's our first state is the state of suffering. Again, the brain thinks we're dying. It triggers norepinephrine, triggering a fight or flight response, which creates the suffering. We have to remember that suffering does not create fight or flight, right? Fight or flight is often called the stress chemical. Stress doesn't trigger fight or flight. We're feeling stress because the fight or flight mechanism's been triggered. We, I mean, that's the biggest thing to get, right? So um, the second state of consciousness we're going to talk about is the other primal state. So primates generally exist in two states, dying, not dying, right? <laughs> so we're not in our not dying state. I call this a surviving state. I'm going to survive today, right? The tiger's not chasing me. My relationships are okay. My, I have my job. I have a home to live in. So all the things that made me feel safe are okay today, right? Even if they're not perfect, they're, they're okay enough that I don't feel like a tiger's chasing me. I didn't do that. The brain chemical that's released is serotonin. So, um, in fact, I call serotonin the I'm not dying chemical. <laughs> so it's released through the digestive system. We'll talk a little bit more about body systems, but serotonin is what's released. And we enter what's called a rest and digest state, right? So this is when basically we're not being chased by that tiger. We're, we're okay. We've reached primal homeostasis. And we feel safe and well. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up on both of them. Okay. Um, so we have the second state, which is, again, we're going to survive. We're not being chased. Serotonin is released. We enter rest and digest. And we enter a state of safety and well-being. And the next state we want I want to talk about is thriving. This is where we separate from primates. This is a purely human experience. I mean, a lot of things in nature can thrive. Thriving is not exclusive to humans, but how the human brain functions and responds to it is very different. So what happens when we enter a thriving state, dopamine is released. Dopamine is often, just like serotonin, stated to be a feel-good chemical. It's better to think of serotonin as the chemical of safety and well-being, and dopamine is a success chemical more than just a feel good chemical, more than just a pleasure chemical. Now, when dopamine's released, we feel good. We feel good. We do feel pleasure, but again, it's not triggered by pleasure. The result of dopamine being released is pleasure. We feel we feel peaceful. We feel we're back to human homeostasis and a lot of things happen in the body that I'm going to get into in detail. 
But ultimately, that feel good is the release of dopamine, which then we feel successful and valuable. So again, thinking of this as a success chemical more than a feel good chemical, a pleasure chemical, um, helps us to understand the power it has in our lives and in our brain function. Um, so serotonin is the safe chemical, dopamine is the pleasure chemical. Mm-hmm. Okay, so again, thriving state, dopamine's released. We enter what I call human homeostasis because this is the natural state of humans. I always tell people, think of the three-year-old. You know, they don't have the fully mature brain developed yet that we get into when we start talking about the insula, but, um, you know, they're um, thriving, happy, you know, wanting to do the next thing, flexible, all of that stuff. And so that's that's the natural state. That's our organic state if we're not triggering. Um, I will talk in, in future sessions about what I um, call the striving level, which is the next level of human development. And it's where we're innovative and motivated. Now, Um, this, I do get into a little bit deeper in the science behind miraculous healing next week. I talk about it a lot in more of the advanced studies. This is where we're kind of getting more into around phase, um, three and four. So I won't cover it tonight, but I do want to mention it. I do really recognize that there's four states of consciousness that humans interact with. So we're going to pro we're going to stay in the first three tonight, particularly the first two. So we're going to talk first about the fight or flight state and what the body does. So at a physical level, what's happening is we have an enlarged amygdala. So the amygdala is the thing that triggers fight or flight. So it's the thing that triggers that release of um, norepinephrine, that extra release. The amygdala is where all of our emotional memory is. And it is the thing that is measuring that threat. So what happens if a person has what's called, what I call an overactive fight or flight response, they have an enlarged amygdala. Okay. And so what's happening is that means the amygdala is having a bit of a hair trigger. So it tends to mean we get triggered into that state of suffering easily, right? States of feeling insecure, conditions like PTSD, depression, um, anger, emotionally reactive is a really good way to think of an enlarged amygdala. If we're really super emotionally reactive, that's a state of the amygdala being triggered because it triggers heightened emotional response. So in this, again, the brain chemical that's released is norepinephrine, the neurotransmitter. And in this, I'm going to talk about the five major neurotransmitters. If it's a neuro, if I don't talk about it, it means it's a secondary transmitter. If you get the five right, the rest of the brain works well. <laughs> so I focus on the five major neurotransmitters. So norepinephrine being the first one. The other two that are released with norepinephrine are epinephrine and histamine. So these are two more of the five major neurotransmitters. Now epinephrine, we tend to understand what epinephrine does. So like I said, norepinephrine makes us awake and alert. So again, in a fight or flight response, we want more alert, more focus, more, we want to be as awake as possible, right? Because we're... <laughs> Consider the fact that when you're in, your, you're in the state, regardless of your trigger, as far as your brain is concerned, a tiger's chasing you. So if you're imagining trying to run away from a tiger, your brain is going to have to be really alert, really focused, right? Really sharp. And so that's what norepinephrine does. Epinephrine is adrenaline, right? Norepinephrine is sometimes called noradrenaline. So epinephrine being adrenaline, we understand, we all see, understand that state of fight or flight, right? where your heart races, your blood vessels contract so that you um, increase blood pressure, your body pumps out a bunch of sugar, right? Everybody talks about gaining weight from stress because your body pumps a bunch of sugar so your muscles can use that sugar to run harder or to fight better, run faster, right? So you pump out a bunch of sugar. um, All these things happen. um, You have that rush of adrenaline in your system. The other... His, the other neurotransmitter that's released, that's one of the five major, is histamines. And this is what I want to talk about more today, that um, even then epinephrine, because we get that fight or flight response. 
But histamine is a thing that we often don't talk about. And I want to talk about what histamine does when we get triggered. So what's happening is the brain triggers this fight or flight response. All of a sudden, we're pumping a bunch of adrenaline and the brain's conserving, consuming a lot of energy using the norepinephrine for focus. So a lot of times you'll hear statements like you only, we only uh, use 10% of our brain at a time. That's inaccurate. We use our whole brain. But we only produce enough electricity in our body to use about 10% at a time. So the body is an electrical machine. It creates electrical currents. It creates energy. Now, it only has a certain allotted amount of energy based off what we've created, right? And so the brain, when we're using all of a sudden all this adrenaline, right, we're increasing our heart rate, we're run, we're we're pumping a bunch of adrenaline and norepinephrine. And so what the brain does is start shutting down other systems in the body to conserve energy. The brain will literally kill us trying not to die. <laughs> because and, and it's just systematically doing what it knows to do. We don't have enough energy, so I'm going to start shutting down systems, right? So the systems it's shutting down begin with H1. This is our allergic reaction. Most people understand allergic reaction when it comes to histamine, right? We've taken antihistamines for seasonal allergies, or we, if somebody has a strong allergic reaction, they might get a shot from an EpiPen, that's epinephrine, or they might get Benadryl, right? These are antihistamines that we know about, which is the allergic reaction response. So what's happening is if a tiger's chasing you, your brain doesn't care if you're allergic to things, right? It needs to conserve energy so it can run from the tiger. Now, I'm going to have listed below um, where these histamines are stored in the body. I'm not going to talk about that. That's just there for people with specific medical conditions. They know these terms. And so if a person has certain problems with certain, um, like if they have smooth muscle problems, they know about that. And so I'm just letting people know this is the histamine that's being affected. So you have H1 allergic response. The second thing that shuts down is our GI tract. This is the H2 histamine, right? Fight or flight or rest and digest. The body doesn't want to be digesting when we're running from a tiger. Also, digestion takes an enormous amount of energy in the system. So the, the body shuts down the GI tract, right, when we're triggered. The third thing it shuts down is our central nervous system. Now, I don't know that it necessarily shuts them down in this order. I'm just saying the third thing because it's the H3, it might shut down in a different order for you. But this is our uh, central nervous system. So basically, we're shutting down the ability to feel what's happening in the body. Because if you're running from a tiger and you're running through a forest and you're getting cut, your body doesn't want to feel that right now. It has to be able to focus. So our body shuts off those receptors from the central nervous system. Um, this is why a lot of times when people have a car accident, they may not feel it for a couple days, right? It's not that they weren't injured the day of the accident. It wasn't that the body wasn't in pain the day of the accident. It's that the body shut down, shuts down the pain receptors as part of conserving energy because of the trauma. So, yeah, it's shutting down that entire central nervous system. The fourth thing it's going to shut down is our immune response. Right. So this is why if people are stressed a lot. They tend to get sick. Right. But immune response, again, I have to worry about my immune system if I'm running from a tiger. These are all systems that use energy. So the brain is shutting them down to conserve that energy. So what I want to talk about is what happens when we get histamine imbalance. So histamine imbalance means we might have an excess of histamines, a lesser amount of histamines. It doesn't mean a malfunction. It means the brain is shutting it off because we're triggered. We're triggering too much. But it's not a malfunction, but it's causing an imbalance because we get because of the amount of times we're triggered triggered. If we have an overactive fight or flight response, we're triggering too much. And so the body's shutting off systems, turning it back on, Jamie, you know, and it's going back and forth. And so it creates an imbalance. Systems and conditions that result from histamine imbalance are weight disorders, skin disorders, GI disorders, anaphylaxis, ulcers, allergies, food disorders, motion sickness, leaky gut, nutrient deficiencies, blood vessel dilation, bacterial infestations, autoimmune disease, neurological disease, hormone imbalances, mood disorders, sleep-wake disorders, cognitive function disorders, 
cancer, autism, overall body pain, seizure disorders, respiratory disorders, and asthma. Nearly every illness known to man is the result of a histamine imbalance caused by an overactive fight or flight response. The pharmaceutical companies know this. This is why when you see pharmaceuticals, a pharmaceutical that treats cancer might have the same side effects as a pharmaceutical that treats depression because they're approaching a histamine. They're trying to turn the histamines back on, right? And we're going to talk about why that can't completely work, but it does work to an extent, right? If I take Benadryl, it's going to stop the alert, the, the, an intense allergic response in my system. If I take an antibiotic, it's going to help my immune system. If I take pain, something for pain relief, right? People take things for depression all the time and feel improvement. MAOIs worked for me in, initially, right? Until I got to the point where I no longer needed them, until I had more balance. So again, what's happening at a physical level is we have an enlarged, enlarged amygdala, which is creating an overactive fight or flight response, which is shutting down systems in our body, which is then creating pain and sickness. Now what's happening at this point is we are dying. So we've triggered a threat of imminent death, but now we're actually dying because the brain is shutting off critical systems that we need to live. And especially if you think of the fact, if you think of how much time in a day you spend stressed or depressed or anxious or unhappy, all of these are the results of that trigger. And if we're in them too long, our systems are shut off, right? So what happens on a mental level is we feel powerless, right? We have no control. We are subject to external conditions. We have depression, anxiety, stress, PTSD, addiction, mental illness. What's happening on an emotional level is we're vulnerable. Now understand the word vulnerable. The word vulnerable is used a lot to be authentic and raw. That's not what vulnerable means. Vulnerable means at risk, under threat, right? If we're vulnerable to something, we're at risk. And so we can feel, so we'll, that we'll feel emotionally vulnerable when we're triggered in a fight or flight response. We'll have anger, sadness, fear, pain, insecurity, lack of motivation. Oops, sorry, go back, I hit the wrong button. Uh, lack of motivation, we feel expendable and alone. So basically everything that's a negative experience of life is a result of this trigger. It's not part of our natural homeostasis. It means that we're in a primal fight or flight response. So again, so we get threat of imminent death. We trigger norepinephrine, epinephrine, and histamine, which is a fight or flight response, the fight or flight state of consciousness, which then creates suffering in our life. What we do on the Inspired Evolution Project, phase one, you'll hear me talk a lot about phases. Phase one is for the relief of suffering. So the very first part of this program that's the most important is understanding that our entire life experience is the result of a chemical. It's never the condition. If your boss is mistreating you and you're upset, it's a chemical. If someone in your life dies and you're sad, it's a chemical. Right? Even though the feelings, it, it doesn't mean that we don't experience real suffering. We're really in pain. But the reason we're in pain is the chemical reaction that's happening in the brain. So um, the first part of phase one is understanding that, really locking that in. Because if you don't understand that your life experience is a result of chemical, you can't take control of it, right? If we still blame its conditions, we, we now gave over all our power to the conditions. Um, the second thing we're doing in phase one is... Um, Learn, gaining the ability to move from a fight or flight state to a rest and digest state at will. No matter how bad we're triggered, no matter what's happened, no matter how extreme. I'm talking about going from a complete panic attack or severe depression into a, a state of feeling safe and well. So we're going to talk about phase one practices. So tonight, I'm not going to do the practices. I really wanted to, but technical difficulties. Well, we'll just talk about the practices. So um, I'm going to give you a list of phase one practices, and I want, to, I want to give you the general understanding of what they are. 
one of the things I stress here is that I don't teach uh, the process. What I give is information, not instruction. Because what pulls any one of us out of a fight or flight state is going to be different. There is not one answer for everyone. And this is the problem with a lot of what's currently out there is it says do this one specific thing to get this one specific result and it doesn't work for everyone so people try thing after thing after thing and end up getting frustrated by it so what i want to talk about is actual practices scientifically proven to release serotonin in the body which puts you into a rest and digest state okay the first one is lying on the floor this is one of the best and works like I'll talk about how as you advance in the in the phases, you have to start changing your early practices because you get more adept at them. But lying on the floor is a mechanism of the body that when the body gets under extreme duress, it makes you pass out, right? So if you get in too extreme a state where the body now is under threat of actually having something happen, the brain will make you lose consciousness and it'll buckle your knees and put you on the floor. I have a question about that. Is there a psychology behind being on the floor versus being on a yoga mat? Like the yoga mat's on the floor. It doesn't matter. Okay. So it it, but it won't work on a couch or bed. Okay. It has to be the floor because the brain has to perceive it as you've collapsed. <laughs> you've given up. <laughs> right. Well, something's right. happened. Also, right. if a tiger's chasing you, the last thing you're going to do is lay on a, on the floor. Right. Okay. So Usually it. Usually, your muscles are tense and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas if you're laying on the ground, the opposite of moving. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so like yoga mat or like maybe a sheet. Yeah, you can put something on the floor. That's fine. And you can lay on the grass as long as you're, and you can be on a third floor apartment. As long as your brain perceives it as the ground. I'm now on the floor. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the second thing is um, understanding that what's causing this is sensory information combined with memory is what's caused the trigger in the first place we can use that to trigger ourselves out of it. So what we want to create is a positive trigger. So we're going to use sensory information to do that. So for example, uh, you can use smell. If there's a certain candle you like the smell of, essential oils, um, incense. If you um, sound, soothing music, listening to the sound of rain, listening to... Um, uh, birds chirping, you know, whatever is soothing to you. There are a lot of things out there um, on the area of sound. There's binaural music, there's ASMR. Not everything works for everyone. Try different things. Like ASMR does not make me, I can't remember the okay. initials, but what it is, is it's, it's videos and it's whispering mm -hmm. and um, combing hair and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it's, it's low, low frequency noise, but level of white noise or deep noise or something. Yeah, and that's another thing is like I just listening to the noises. Like I like brown noise, but you know, so I, it's like that, but it's yeah, it's just really quiet. And part of it, I think, is the the um, strain of hearing it. So when you have to strain to hear something, it makes you caught your systems calm down. So when you're like really listening, really hard, straining to hear something. Now, some people, that's part of a triggered state, right? Mm -hmm. Where if they hear a noise in their house at night, straining to listen feels triggering. But there are stories like Calm, the app Calm, has sleep stories where what they do is they start at a certain volume and cadence and they, slowly, they start to talk slower and lower the volume which then makes your brain reach for hearing it, which then puts it in a calm state and actually puts you to sleep. You think it's the opposite. You were well, going to say something? Used that actually, so it actually mm -hmm. I was just going to comment on um, a real life. Is, is, is this video an example in real life where some people fall asleep to the radio or the TV on mm -hmm. and like other people it keeps them awake? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, each person is going to be really unique in it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so you, so you want personal sensory stuff that's pleasing to you. It can be visual. Uh, this is why a lot of people wear meditations. Um, one of the things, other things I recommend is spiritual practice. So if you have one, this is the real power behind um, spiritual practices. If you don't have one, don't try and create one because you, you already need to have a faith base in it. But 
um, triggered states are very isolating. When animals are in a dying state, they wander off to die alone, and we tend to start to isolate ourselves. This is what's happening with depression and suicide law, is this isolation. Mm -hmm. So reaching out to something bigger than ourselves starts to pull us out of the fight or flight state, right? Remember, social survival. So even if we're connecting with a higher being or a deity or a, a one mind concept, something like that, um, that will help pull us out. Um, other things. Um, so you want to start stimulating the body's thinking mechanisms. So one of the things that's a primal survival mechanism. So, so again, primates being the weakest of the predators, what they developed in order to survive was intellect to think through things, to problem solve, to be creative, to throw things. Judy smiling because she knows. Yo, so this is why we get monkey mind. <laughs> we want to overthink things. We want to think them through and that, but that's a soothing state. So um, instead of getting wrapped in a cyclic thinking or ruminating, um, grabbing early development learning, because when you're triggered, you have no new thought available. Your brain's reacting according to training. So the part of the brain that has new ideas is off. And so we are we have what's already available to us. So um, just grab hold of early development skill and make it more complicated. So complicating thought helps us, but we don't want to go too complicated. So for example, uh, doing the alphabet backwards or counting complex ways like count by random numbers like seven or eight or counting sums is one I really like. Uh, one plus one is two, two and two is four, four and four is eight, 16, 32. The reason why is it starts out easy and it gets, you're in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands pretty quickly. And so then you're having really to concentrate to try and hold on to those numbers. And if, if you lose it, then you just start over, right? Um, another thing is reading or audiobooks, but you don't want anything too complex. Again, you want early development, so um, reading can really fall in the area of distraction. So um, distraction is um, doing reading and, and um, recreational books, something like Harry Potter, not philosophy, not in this state. Um, another thing is filling in a predefined space. I'm going to reach over here. I meant to grab this before. Sorry, video people. Get yeah, my face right up there. But these books, these coloring books, in fact, you'll see. In fact, I have one over here that I usually can't. Oh, did you? Yeah. Anti stress coloring books. <laughs> so the whole purpose of these is to relax us. Now, there's a certain rule I want you to follow if you use one of these books. Um, I have an example here, I think. I don't know where I did with it. But anyway, completely fill in the space and try and stay within the lines. So you don't want to just color and, and scribble, right? Completely fill in each space and try to stay within the lines. And I'm going to explain that more. Don't judge it and let it take a long time right? You can also do paint by number. There's tons of paint by number apps on phones. You can do jigsaw puzzles, right? This is why jigsaw puzzles are really soothing to people. So what you want to do is be filling in a predefined space, one you haven't defined. Um, more sensory uh, stuff you can try. Again, go through all your senses. Touch. That couch over there is a perfect meditation spot for me because the minute I touch it, I'm soothed. It's so soft and it's turquoise, so soft and turquoise. It's like a win-win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, going outside is great for sensory information, right? A change in scenery triggers the brain to work in a different way, but also going outside, being around more thriving life helps. Um, also, you can include in that um, mild meditation, or not mild meditation, mild exercise. You don't want to do strenuous exercise when triggered because your muscles are already contracted and this is how a lot of people self-injure. It's because your muscles are contracted and then you're going to go contract them further and you're going to tear a tendon or a ligament or something and you're going to have a problem. So it's better to go for a walk, do a little yoga or tai chi, just stretching. Just muscle stretching is good, just doing some stretching, doing deep breathing. Um, if you're going to do breathing, deep breaths, slow deep breaths, no hatha fire breath. 
You want to do a soothing breath, so deep breaths. If you're taking deep breaths, this is telling the brain that you're in a, you're not in fight or flight anymore because the breath becomes more rapid in fight or flight. So when you slow it down, you're telling the brain, oh, we're not in fight or flight anymore. And so it will trigger serotonin. I don't think I've probably missed them. I don't know where my cheat sheet is, but um, that's a lot of them. And I'm constantly posting stuff. Uh, also, if anyone ever has any questions on it, uh, you can post them in comments or on the message board meetup. And I'll respond, same thing on Facebook. There's a private group called the Inspired Evolution Project. Um, people can post things there anytime they want, and I'll answer questions. Is so. Joe still listening? No. No, don't try and make me laugh if I'm triggered. Okay. I will want to end a person. <laughs> right? If I'm in a triggered state and people try and make me laugh, it's uh, that's not it doesn't go well. Well, what about watching Seinfeld? That means you're not triggered. That means you're already in a rest and digest state. Oh, okay. When you're triggered, Seinfeld's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is funny. You're dying. You're being chased by a tiger. Nothing is funny about that. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely a phase two practice. I just <laughs> okay. So continuing now, we're going to go into rest and digest and what the body does when we enter that rest and digest state. So this is how you should feel after you've done a practice. So at, if you're triggered, um, one of the things I say a lot is I is I recommend not using this pro, this process or this this information just to handle triggers. There's going to be some foundational stuff I recommend in changing the way your brain function works. But uh, when you're in a triggered state, after doing the practice, you should feel what I'm going to talk about. If you don't, do a different practice. Don't give up. We were talking about this last night um, after the meetup. It was, it's, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Then you try something else. You keep trying it. It's worth it. Um, everything I say, because sometimes fight or flight mechanisms, um, can feel good. <laughs> Righteous indignation is one of the worst. It's like when you have a right to be angry, right? Or have a right to feel a certain way, we can, we'll stay in that. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is it worth dying for? Because anytime I stay in a state of suffering, I'm in a dying process. My body is aging and dying. Uh, I just wanted to mention, based on what you said, Adam, there's those people who say, I love adversity, mm -hmm. right? Because it makes me feel stronger. Or those people who are like, I love stress because they get that adrenaline rush and they start putting rid of, you would probably recommend like not to go that route. Right? Like, well, they don't. So if, if it's a stress feeling, um, sometimes people don't use the words that they're, that, you know, the words that they're using won't correlate. So for example, if they're feeling like it's going to make them work harder, that's motivation, which is a different brain function. Okay. Um, so they're brain. calling it stress, okay. but it's not as much an adrenaline rush. An adrenaline rush comes from threat of imminent death. Okay. So it is always a trigger. Now, some people do start to like the feeling of it because they do feel stronger. Because if we feel, if we're the weak gazelle, if we're the one being chased by the tiger. We, we want someone else to be weaker than us. We want to, to gain position some way. So sometimes people will use it to motivate like adrenaline rushes and stuff. And I'm going to talk about why that happens when, as we talk about the prefrontal cortex, you know. So it's kind of like a lot of times, though, people that what we're experiencing when we're remaining in a fight or flight is a state of suffering. Now, if the person has to have the adrenaline rush to feel alive, then that means that whenever they don't have it, they feel dead, which is a state of suffering. So it's kind of like picking through all those little, yeah, the little... Um, realizations of it. and it's finally coming to understand like we've talked about before that um some people don't even know they're suffering they have low level stress all the time they have no idea they're suffering they think it's fine yeah well and it's it's a natural state if they cut it their whole life especially if it's an adopted condition right so um it's going to vary depending on the individual. So we really have to start to get to know. We, and this is the thing I talk about. You want to start using your life as a um, gauge. So the mood I am has, I'm in isn't about the conditions. It's about whether or not I'm triggered. And I can start using that to gauge and say, well, if I'm feeling any state of suffering, that means I'm triggered. I want to get out of that. 
rather than blaming the condition and saying, well, of course I feel that way because this happened or, you know, right. because then we're just keeping ourselves and it, and it ends up giving, we give our power away to that condition. Yes, yes, yeah. So what the body does as we come out of it is on a physical level, we still have an enlarged amygdala. So when we've entered a rest and digest state, we haven't altered the amygdala. The amygdala is still ready because it's like, okay, well, yeah, you're in rest and digest now, but I have to be prepared for the next trigger. And so the amygdala is still enlarged. So we're still subject to a fight or flight response when we're entering a rest and digest state. Now the systems are back on, but they're not at their peak. So we're going to feel better. And so this is why I always say I call serotonin the I'm not dying chemical um, because it not dying feels better than dying. And for some people, that's the best we feel. That's the best I felt. I was in fight or flight 90% of the time. Rest and digest 10%. And I had no idea what thriving was. I had no idea. I couldn't even conceive of the concept. So I just, those, those rest and digest moments for me were gold. That was life being good, the best it could get, right? So it does feel better, but we're not in peak performance at this, at this level. We are still dependent on the practice, right? So if I'm counting on the um, whatever I'm going to to get myself out of my fight or flight state, I am now dependent on that thing to get me out, right? So there's still a dependency there. So what I want to uh, talk about is understanding dependency. Um, I've got to keep doing I'm doing better than I thought I would. <laughs> so understanding dependency and the addictive cycle, what's really happening in the addictive cycle. And I'm going to explain, having been a severe addict, was a severe addict for the majority of my early life. And so I've been on both sides of the coin, and it is not about dopamine. <laughs> dopamine is released, and the reason why is survival. Um, the, the, the body's trying to heal from the damage of some addictive chemicals and stuff like that. But I'm going to talk about what's really happening, what addicts are really seeking. And uh, it's huge and it helps us break addiction wide open and make it curable rather than a lifelong condition. So what's happening in is the addictive cycle is you're having a sensory trigger occur, right? So some sight, sound, taste, touch, smell is combined with some memory, yours or some ancestral memory, and you and you've entered a high state of suffering. Right. So here I am. My life is stressed or my life is sad. I'm depressed. I'm angry, whatever. I'm in my state of suffering. What happens is the brain wants to relieve that suffering. Right. Because first of all, it's killing us. Second of all, the suffering is. Is causing damage to our body. That stress state is causing damage. So um what we what what's been classified as reward systems and now this can work in primates primates can be trained in reward systems but and i'll talk about that more in a minute but what it is is self-medication most advanced medical communities now call addiction self-medication right it is not a malfunction of the brain the brain is dying and it wants to not be dying so at, addiction is about not about pleasure it's about, I'm suffering so much. I just need relief for a minute. I just need something to make me feel a little better. And not dying feels better than dying. So we go to that. And at some point, everything we're addicted to, everything we have dependency on, made us feel better at some point. And so it's what our brain returns to. Again, you're not having new thought when you're in high suffering state. So you're not having new ideas. So for somebody to walk up to somebody that's in negative thinking patterns and go think positively, it's biologically impossible, right? And to think positively when you're triggered in a negative state. The first thing we have to do is relieve the suffering. So what happens is we relieve the suffering. That happens. It becomes a new sensory trigger. So then it becomes, oh, this thing makes me safe. Then we get triggered again. I stay the suffering. Relieve the suffering. Still addiction, right? This is just the addictive cycle. Sensory trigger, high sense state of suffering, relief of suffering. Because, and the thing is, is on the sensory trigger, what we're trying to control is an impossible thing to control. We need to control the right thing. And the problem is most approaches don't approach the right thing. 
They're trying to control something that's an after effect. We can't really move states of suffering by approaching the suffering itself. Because it's a byproduct of the trigger. We have to approach the trigger. The problem is the trigger is unpredictable. Right? If it's somebody grabbing my arm that's causing me to have a trigger every time somebody touches my arm. Well, we've had a million scenarios in our life that are all sorts of random triggers that we don't think about. You know, sending a child to their room without dinner or telling them, you know, or kids in school excluding a child. All these things become triggers in our mind that we are not consciously aware of. It's all happening on an unconscious level. So to try and control the after effect of it doesn't work that well. It, it can work, but it's nominal. It's it's arduous and incremental is what I call it. So I'm going to go back through this. I went through these on that and I forgot to do it here. So again, um, what happens when we're entering, we're relieving suffering when we enter the state of rest and digest. Our systems are on, but not peak. And um, we live in dependency or addiction in a reward-based model. But it's not really reward. I'm going to talk about. So yeah. even though they're, they're getting... Um, um, dopamine. They're not. It's not dopamine. They're not. It's serotonin. Okay. In the addiction, when they get, when they shoot up, don't they feel dopamine? So what we're getting is, so what happens is, when we put drugs in our body, alcohol, drugs, anything that's damaging, refined sugar into the body, the body will trigger dopamine to try and heal itself. Okay. Right. But what the what the goal of the addict is, is to re relieve the suffering. Okay. You, we're generally hard pressed to find anybody that's been had a, a long standing addiction that says it's about pleasure. Okay. It's pretty miserable. It's pretty miserable being an addict okay. because even those drugs don't feel good. They don't feel good. They just feel better than life felt before. That was the moment I quit using hard drugs. Um, I was still an alcoholic after that, but I quit hard drugs by coming, I was coming down off of a drug and I just suddenly, I was like grinding my teeth and I was driving my fingernails into my hand and I was shaking and I had a migraine because every time I did the strike, I did a migraine. And I just sat there and suddenly I went, how bad was my life that this felt better? Right? It's just life is so miserable and so impossible, and there's nothing else in that moment that seems like it can help. And so at some point, the, the drug made us feel better. So there are certain drugs that stimulate dopamine, right? And, and stimulate those feelings that cause dopamine release in the system. But the goal of addiction is not about the dopamine release. It, it is about feeling good, but because of the state of suffering. I've, had, I've worked with a lot of people that have addiction, and they just quit organically. I mean, I've talked about one person that came in that drank every night, came in and said, you know, I realize I've been doing the practices, and I haven't had a drink in two and a half weeks. I didn't even realize it. Because you don't crave the drink if you're not triggered, right? So that's what's making us, by the fact that we're not in that feeling. So you can look at things like amphetamines that do make us feel good, and so you crave that good feeling. But good feeling is our natural homeostatic state. So the real motivation is the fact that we are suffering and we want to end the suffering, right? Which is a result of brain function. So, yeah, so there's different drugs are going to do different things, but ultimately all addiction, because drug addiction is no different than porn addiction or shopping addiction or TV addiction. And none of those are, are causing the kind of chemical outcome that is um, really driven by. So for example, if I'm addicted to TV and watch too much TV, I'm not getting dopamine. I'm getting serotonin. I feel safe being distracted in somebody else's story right now, right? It's a distraction so I can trigger safety and well-being. but there's no dopamine there. There's no, they might get to the point where I laugh at something, but I'm not really driving dopamine, not the kind of dopamine that's gonna trigger the insula. I never feel motivated after watching TV. <laughs> you know, so usually people just want to keep watching. Right. Because it's the drug, right? It's the same as if I get fired from my job and I trigger fight or flight. I might if I have a food addiction, I might stop and want to get chocolate cake on the way home. I'm gonna feel good while I'm eating the chocolate cake until the cake's gone. Right? 
it's my belief in the cake that makes me feel better. It's the taste, the flavor, the sensory trigger of it. But again, I'm dependent now on the cake to feel good, right? So um, ultimately, oh, I'm gonna, it's gonna come up in a minute. I'm gonna talk about this overall as a whole in just a couple of slides. Um, so what's happening again on that physical level, our amygdala is still alive, enlarged. We're su still subject to fight or flight response. Systems are on it, but not peak, and we're dependent on whatever has relieved the suffering, right? On a mental level, we're just in primal homeostasis, which means we're still subject to external triggers, right? So right now we're in just primal rest and digest. So we're in a we're in the same models that monkeys are using. That that I'm not running from a tiger right now. I've I've found a way to hide from the tiger for today. Doesn't mean that tiger won't show up tomorrow or in an hour from now or in five minutes from now, right? I'm I'm just I'm still subject to that. Um, I relieve the suffering. I feel secure and placated. I might be in a thinking analytical monkey mind, but this is when we're in a fight or flight state, we can't think very well. So it is an improvement. So we should be able to be in a state where we are, where we can think on an emotional level. I feel safe and my safety is in familiarity. So I'm still subject to change being a trigger. Um, I am dependent on my tribe. If I lose a tribe member or a relationship it could be a trigger and I am ex subject to externalized value. So it feels better, but it's really not good enough. Not for humans. I think my interest is, I, uh, I'm not familiar with the term monkey mind. What does that basically mean? That's just thinking problem solving. Okay. Yeah, so like when we ruminate, just yeah. thinking too much. Yeah. Because so when we... Overanalyzing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay. Because when we're doing that, we're only accessing what we already know. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so we're just cycling so through what we already yeah. know. So it's kind the of worrying and the, the ruminating, mm -hmm. the, wor the, mm -hmm. the worry going. And the, the well, and figure any, out how to fix it or we keep thinking about the problem. So yeah. Or true. any problem solving. People can get addicted to problem solving. You know, for me, like early on in my process, I got addicted to therapy because I could think through, find something wrong. And when I fixed it, fixed it, I got an adrenaline rush from that. I got actually dopamine rush where I felt strong and felt you know so it was the good adrenaline it was the oh i can do this i feel good right because i fixed something right but that meant i constantly wanted to be ripping myself apart all the time so so my therapist <laughs> fired me from therapy <laughs> she told me i was as good as i was gonna get she didn't know me very well that way but she knew me really well who i she knew who i was then she didn't know what i was capable of so, um, yeah, so, so it really is monkey mind is just a thinking mind because humans are really to the point now where we can be beyond that. Um, so, um, just to review phase one, again, we want to understand that all of our thoughts, feelings, emotions are byproduct, not cause. So if you're stressed, you're triggered, you can get yourself out by one of the practices. Uh, the second thing is we want to be able to be adept at moving from a, a fight or flight state to a rest and digest state at will. We want to be able to enter it and maintain it. Now, a lot of people rush through phase one really fast because they just want, they want to be out of the fight or flight, I think, mostly. Um, but really being able to establish the skill of being able to recognize your life as byproduct is so important. And being able to have anything happen to trigger you and to be able to pull yourself out of that trigger instantly is really critical. You know what I learned the other day when I got triggered because I was taking a walk and I was feeling really loggy and I had on my classical music which usually is very soothing to me but it didn't work. And what I could have thought of but I couldn't think because I was in that state is that I needed to put on happy music. I really needed that happy music and I didn't think of it because yeah. I was triggered. Yeah. So it's like, got to have it in me. Well, it's not, it's just doing phase one and then always making sure we're doing a phase two practice 
after. We can't ever stay with just phase one, which we'll talk about. I do want to warn people it's eight o'clock. So I know I got oh. started late and I'm running a little late. So I don't know. Um, I want to make sure I get to the, I'm going to get through the phase two practices, but I wanted to warn people. Um, so the important thing to know in this is um, I should be done in like the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, even healthy rest and digest mechanisms keep us in dependency or we're dependent upon the mechanism. So it's really important that we, we pull ourselves out of fight or flight, but we don't want to stay in rest and digest. This is what we've been doing our whole lives. We get triggered, we pull ourselves out. We get triggered, we pull ourselves out. Some of our mechanisms are healthy, some aren't, but we've been spending our whole life doing this. We need to break the pattern. Like you said, Judy, when you were walking, the calming music was just rest and digest. It doesn't break the cycle, right? So what we want to do is learn how do we truly break the cycle. So we have to remember that, um, what is happening? Let's try that slide again. So what we have to remember is that the sensory trigger affects the release of chemical, which puts us in these different states of consciousness, which then results in the life experience that we're having, right? Now, a lot of things out there want to approach the light of life experience, want to approach the state of suffering, want, want us to work, you know, try to be positive, work on your boundaries, do all these things. These things can work, but, but they are arduous and incremental. Because what we're trying to do is change a brain function from the condition that brain function makes. So it's kind of like what I think it was Einstein that said it, um, that you can't solve a problem from the thinking, thinking that created the problem, right? And so we're in this state and of suffering, and we're trying to address it from the state of suffering. That won't work. That's why I've had a lot of the psychologists, mm -hmm. a lot of the therapy that we do is that way. Yeah. And that's why... This is a great, me. yeah. The, a lot of the techniques and the therapeutic practices that we have and I work with clients on is very arduous and mm -hmm. incremental. Yeah. And you know what's really cool is um, from the people that have come before, I've had a lot of people um, both in nursing and in therapy come commonly. They're, they're probably the two trades that come the most. Being able to apply these practices into a therapeutic process, because I think the thing I miss in my functions is that ability literally to diagnose, right, to to um, understand everything at, of the condition at the condition level, right, which I think is huge. But then to be able to apply practices that cause brain function shifts while still being able to work with people at that level of practice that therapeutic means offers, I think is a huge advantage. I think it's a, it's a, it's a massive advantage. Yeah. To be able to use these things into a practice. Yeah. Um, so again, there, are, and then there are a lot of systems that want to work at the state of consciousness, right? But again, the state of consciousness is as much byproduct. So to try and address the state of consciousness that's causing the suffering in life is not going to work well. Oops. So again, we, where we really want to work is at the level of chemical. The chemical is the thing that's either the problem or the solution, depending on your experience of the chemical, right? The chemical is everything. Um, so what we need to do is we need to address the sensory trigger because the sensory trigger is what's driving the chemical. Now, the sensory trigger is completely unconscious. So we have to, so, so we have to use a program that develops unconscious effect on the brain. So we want to go back to talking about where triggers begin. So again, we can't, we can't tell the, the neurons don't fire that chemical when you get that information. That's going to be impossible. We also can't control what's happening to us at a sensory level. Oh, sorry about that. I had it off until eight. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and no, I don't want it to vibrate. Okay. So, um, at a sensory level, to try again to break down those cycles of what was the original trigger that caused this, the grab on the arm or um, what people call body memory, uh, which is just really a neural connection um, that says when this happens to my body, this is going to happen next. And so I'm going to trigger based off of that. So, you know, again, if I get that arm grab, I'm going to get attacked. So my brain's going to try and warn me. 
But if I walk in a house and smell brownies cooking, I may think I'm going to get a brownie, right? And then I may get happy <laughs> if it's a brownie that's good for me. No. <laughs> which they do have them, which is lovely, where I don't have to eat refined sugar or I can even be vegan. <laughs> there are a couple of places that have really good ones. Anyway, so uh, that sensory information says something good is going to happen, right? So what we really want to approach is the memory. Now, here's the issue with approaching the memory. Um, there are, again, those three levels of memory, right? There's the primal. So literally approaching something like trypophobia or something like fear of snakes or something like that, that memory has been there for a long time. So try and address that memory and um, alter the original rule of that memory is, again, going to be ardu arduous and incremental. The second thing is um, personal experience. Therapy gave me my life. I literally was trying to die. I had had a near-death experience uh, when I was 15, and I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to be alive. My life was horrible. It was horrible. I had no reason to be here. I didn't have one single thing that I felt was a reason to be alive. So I was mad when I lived. I was really mad about it. So I spent the next year, eight years trying to kill myself. I was wild. I was completely out of control because I was just continually trying to die. Right? And so in that state, I don't want to go back and process those memories. There was a beautiful moment for me in therapy that I grabbed hold of that I don't know how much my therapist enjoyed it, but it was a really profound moment for me when she said, you don't have to remember to heal. A lot of times we don't have memories. And a lot of the reason why is because our prefrontal cortex shuts off when trauma happens. So the, the storing of new information shuts off. So the last thing our brain remembers is that arm grab a lot of the times. To go back and relive that is traumatizing. It's re-traumatizing the brain. And it is so hard to cure conditions like PTSD in that, in that environment. But it's kind of the best we've had available to do that. We're trying to take a lot of different approaches, but these are still the same thing. They're trying to approach a, a, a process-driven method to go back and, and work through each memory. Now, mm -hmm. also when you were someone like me, I, I started my healing process at about the age of 23. Every day up until the age of 23, I was going through traumatic events. That's a lot of memory to process. If mm -hmm. I had stuck to traditional processing methods, it would have been accurate. I would not have been cured. I wouldn't. It would have taken me hundreds of years to process everything that happened to me because each memory took months. And I had millions of memories. Therapy, yeah, story. right, exactly. And that's not the thought, the fault of therapy. That's the fact that uh, trying to approach it from a memory level at that way becomes complicated. The other complicated thing is you're dealing with ancestral memory, which may not have an original point, right? This is where people are doing past life stuff and things like that. You have your personal experience, but then you also have your environment. I was working with a client who had severe sleep disorder that was caused by a sinus infection. What memory are you going to process? The sinus infection? It was a threat of death. The brain wasn't wrong. So how do you process through that and make the brain change it? So these start to look like mechanisms we can't solve. And so instead of specifically approaching the memory, what we want to start doing is building new sensory information in the brain. So this is learning what we can do to control it. So existing options to manage our chemicals, of course, therapeutic treatment. Again, this works. I, this was one of the key moments for me is when I was in therapy that made everything different for me. And that was the fact that I realized early on in therapy that I could perceive my life like a story. And if I changed that story, I felt better. I saw the connection. When we go back and reevaluate this way of thinking and I think a different way, my life gets better. And so I was like, I clicked on that really fast. I did really well in therapy. I was very good. I was a very good client. <laughs> so I dug in. I knew I could make my life better. But again, it was just taking such a long time. And it was a painful journey. Processing emotions at the level of emotions is excruciating. So therapeutic treatment is an option. It does work, but it will be incremental and arduous because it has to be just because of what we're approaching. 
the way we're approaching the condition. Second, second thing we uh, existing option is pharmaceuticals. Now, pharmaceuticals work to an extent. Them, those MAOIs worked for They made me sane enough to be in therapy because I was not sane enough to be in therapy. I wouldn't have stayed in therapy. I wouldn't, <laughs> bless you, I wouldn't have um, gleaned the things I did that helped me change. Now, the other issue with pharmaceuticals is this. You're taking an exogenous chemical or you're triggering a chemical exogenously. So you're, you're taking something into your body to, to trigger a chemical. Your body knows how to trigger chemicals. So, for example, when you're triggering serotonin, your body's using the pancreas. It's using the digestive system. It's using um, the adrenal system. And if I'm taking something to cause that trigger, none of those systems are being used in the way they were designed. So I'm going to have side effects, which means I'm going to take 20 pills instead of one. This is true, too, of supplements. In fact, supplements can be a lot worse than pharmaceuticals because they don't go through clinical trials. They don't have to go through the same testing and they are unpredictable. S supplements for me have been like, they are way more extreme. My body really responds to those a lot more than a pharmaceutical chemical, like pain relief and stuff, they mess me up. So I stay away from supplements. If you do want to use a supplement to try and trigger, I don't use food, let your body ex extract it naturally because if you don't, it then some systems are being messed up. But pharmaceuticals can't give you a permanent relief. It's kind of like for um, antidepressants. All of the pharmaceutical is doing is throwing a bunch of serotonin into your system and hoping it hits the right synapses. <laughs> it's kind of a hit and miss thing, which is why there are so many different kinds of antidepressants and so many different results. Also, we become vulnerable because the body becomes dependent on the pharmaceutical, which is the most dangerous thing about antidepressants, is that oftentimes they make people feel better, they stop taking them, and then there's a hard crash. Because if the pharmaceutical is causing the release of serotonin and I stop taking the pharmaceutical, I don't have serotonin in my system. My body's been regulating it and stopped producing it. So um, if you are on a pharmaceutical, what I recommend is don't stop. Even if you're on a supplement, don't stop. You will organically be taken off. Um, I worked with somebody that cured themselves of Parkinson's and um, they had had it for 20 years. Um, and that when they went in for their annual checkup, because they have to constantly regulate Parkinson's, um, they, te they tested her and they said, well, you don't have Parkinson's. And they took six months to take her off the medication because you have to be weaned off gradually. It's the same when I was on beta blockers. So um, just... If you're on pharmaceuticals, trust that your healthcare professional, whoever you're working with, will change the change the doses, and eventually you'll be off. That's what happened with me and the MAOIs. How did that person treat Parkinson's? Mythology. Okay. Same thing. Yeah, my practices. Well, yeah, all of the practices, so all the phases. Yep. So the next the next option is the placebo effect, which is what we're going to talk about. Now we have to understand how the placebo effect really works. A lot of people are talking placebo effect out there, but a lot of what's available is as arduous and incremental as therapeutic treatment. So I have a lot of people come in and, and compare me to people like Dispenza that I'm not doing the same thing. Because again, he's talking about controlling your thoughts and monitoring your thoughts constantly. That's arduous to me. I can't do that. I'm talking 20 minutes a day of exercise to fire the right brain function. But what a placebo effect is, is not a, not a sugar pill so much. Uh, we hear about sugar pills. Placebo effect means I've caused the body to release the chemical internally rather than taken, taking something to cause the release. So the placebo effect is actually healthy body function, right? The body is now releasing the chemical on its own. It doesn't need something else to offer it. So I want to talk about the IEP practices and how we're releasing those, those same effects. So we're going to go back to talking about what the program will do. Um, this is what we were talking about with serotonin lying on the floor positive sensory triggers. It's a placebo effect that's causing serotonin to be released. So you're overriding the brain's belief that you're in danger and causing it to release a safe a rest and digest chemical. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two is where we break the cycle. This is to become more centered. So we're going to learn how to control our experience experiences through controlling the chemical. Now we want to move from rest and digest to that success state. Right? We want to trigger dopamine. 
So we we don't want to just go fight or flight, rest and digest and do that bounce back and forth. We actually want to start triggering the prefrontal cortex and the release of dopamine in the system. So um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to skip what the body does. So I'm going to be jumping forward because we're already over and I want to go through the exercises. Well, let me do this really quick. So I'm just going to put them all up and I'm going to go through them fast because you're going to want to know this. So when you trigger the prefrontal cortex, what you're going to feel and is... you can take pictures. Yeah, you can take pictures like of the you. slide if you want. Um, Can't so at, it all. Yeah. So at a physical level, what we're doing when we, when we um, are able to finally return to homeostasis and be firing dopamine in a healthy way, we're actually shrinking the amygdala. There have, been there have been studies in neuroscience where they found with the, the right kind of practices, in five weeks, people shrink their amygdala enough to visibly see the difference. As small as the amygdala is, they can visibly see the difference. So it minimizes our fight or flight response. Our systems become fully engaged, which means we're healthy and regenerative. Our body heals. The body heals naturally. We're not trying that, like miraculous healing isn't a miracle. Medical science doesn't dismiss it because it's a miracle. They dismiss it because it's commonplace. Uh, they say that the average person by the age of 40 has had and cured cancer in their body at least four times, right? right? The body's constantly, right? If you cut your finger, it heals. If you break a bone, it heals. You know it'll do that. But it doesn't heal well if the systems are off because you're not producing enough stem cells. You're not, you're not regenerating the cells in the right way. They're not... Um, DNA, as well as everything else in the body, when we're triggered, contracts. And so it's not going to be healthy cell regeneration. Um, on a mental level, you'll feel successful and valuable. You feel clear, centered, capable, no longer subject to conditions. Um, we feel confident and self-realized. At an emotional level, we have a low emotional response. Right? This is often called emotional intelligence. We tend to live in our feeling body rather than our emotional body. This is a real differentiation between the amygdala and the insula, which I get into in deeper study. Um, we're going to be really digging into that. Um, there's, I'm going to be announcing a retreat in October. It's going to be small groups, but um, and we're going to really be digging into the difference between the insula and the amygdala. Um, so we feel happy, healthy. Um, we have empathy. We, we have compassion for people, but we don't, we aren't. Um, empathic. We don't experience other people's emotions and feelings, but we have compassion for them. Um, it's basically a life of balance, thriving state. So I want to get through the practices. We may not get any um, further than that tonight, but I want to make sure uh, I go through the phase two practices. And so this is to become more centered. Phase two is where we're triggering the prefrontal cortex. Right, this is a, a purely human part of the brain. So this is where our human homeostasis is. Um, I'll talk in future sessions, especially as we go into science behind miraculous healing. And if you take some of the more advanced classes, I'll talk about the potential future brain function of humans. But right now, um, it's really about breaking out of the primal function. We need to do that before we can get into a brand, advanced brain function. We need to break the primal pattern of fight or flight and rest and digest. So to do that, we um, are going to do practices that specifically trigger the prefrontal cortex. Um, so um, learning new things. This is the, the part of our brain that we, where we're in a learning state. You can learn anything, but you have to be bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> or it doesn't count. If you're good at it, it's phase one. You have to be bad at it because it has to take your full concentration. So... Um, learn a new language, learn how to juggle, um, learn something complex like Tai Chi, uh, learn advanced um, yoga, things like that. Um, the second thing is, uh, besides learning something new, is go someplace new. This is why vacations make us feel better. Because the brain processes information <coughs> differently when things are unfamiliar. Now you can hear, that here's fight or flight, rest and digest, safety is in familiarity. Right. But in humans, especially at seven and a half billion people where nothing can stay the same, safety is an adaptability. That's the only time we really feel safe is when we feel confident and capable. So we need to be firing that prefrontal cortex. So going new places, an easy way to do this is uh, take different paths to and from work or places that you go on a regular basis. 
I always recommend geocaching. I love geocaching because it tr it hits a lot of points. Um, for people who don't know, that's spelled G E O C A C A C H I N G. You can look it up online, but it's basically where you get GPS coordinates and go to a location and find a box. And people who have been there have signed it and left things. <coughs> you can take trinkets, leave one, take one type of thing. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And it's triggering connection to community, right? It's connecting to other people. The strongest placebo effect in humans is other human connection. So this is why a lot of practices like... Um, acupuncture and things like that are actually more about human connection than they are where the needles go. So um, that's why um, things even like massage, energy work like that, so things that connect us, touch, non-sexual intimate touch from people is really powerful placebo effect in humans. So um, going someplace new, the other thing um, that I recommend is non-dominant hand work. Same rules, use your coloring book. <laughs> And you're going to try and completely fill in the space and try to stay within the lines. Again, don't judge it. Um, but you're going to be coloring with your non-dominant hand. You can do all sorts of things with your non-dominant hand. <coughs> lock and unlock doors. Try brushing your teeth. Just not dangerous. Not dangerous. Yeah, it's like that. <laughs> I have a question. You said go someplace, see the brain process the information differently when you're in the brain. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so uh, non-dominant handwork is a really good one for that. Also, you can look things up online. Anything that fires the prefrontal cortex. Uh, there are a lot of games. Lumosity, Neuronation, right? Things like that. Apps for your phone that you can use that are specifically designed to make you have to think hard. Because you can't ever beat the game. The games just get harder and harder the better you get at the game. Um, this is a good thing, too, that you can do with puzzles, making them more complicated. So, for example, for me, I I played Sudoku to overcome insomnia by by this exact practice. But um, I got I'm so good at it. I can pretty much do it in my sleep now because I it's just a it's just a system I follow now. So I would use Sudoku in phase one because I'm good at it. Crosswords, I'm horrible at. I never think of the clue the way the person who wrote the clue. I'm thinking verb, they're thinking noun. I mean, I just, for some, my brain doesn't work the same way. And I'm horrible at trivia. It's just not, that's not the brain I have. My, my brain is strong in cognitive function, but um, non-critical memory, it just disposes of. <laughs> and so, um, I, so crossword puzzles are really hard for me, but I'm, when I do them, I know I'm working the brain and I don't judge myself. I'll go to the back of a crossword book and get a clue and I go, okay, I just learned that thing. I didn't know what that clue was, but I just learned something. I may not retain it, but I learned it, right? But I want to do the thing that's hard in phase two. Yeah. Oh, I just realized you're running out of time. I was just going to add something to that really quick. Uh -huh. In our mind goes, I'm, I, I'm also using the degree of trouble of mind to with recommendations from a psychiatrist that was my sleep problem. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, uh, but I'm new at it, so it's very challenging. Um, but, uh, when I try to do crossword puzzles, I just get frustrated and it really, you know, my friend made a really good suggestion that changed my whole approach with them, which was don't, there's nothing wrong with like looking up hints and clues online or information online, you yeah. know, cause I'm like, I won't just look at the back for an answer and, right. and it's like an all or nothing thinking. It's like, you know, look it up online, learn about it. Then you're going to, and that's what I love. So then you oh, learn cool, about yeah. whatever the trivia is, you learn about the, Whatever, whether whatever the question is or whatever the right. item is on the trip on the on the crossword puzzle, and then right. you research it and you learn about it, and then you know about it and you figure out what the answer is. That's good. And yeah. That's an, what is that? Well, it's it's a, and it changed, turns it into a learning process. Yes, and mm -hmm. it changed my approach completely. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Really to that. Thanks. Yeah, that's good because again, learning something new yeah. falls into that category, so it includes it in that. Um, other things um, are exercise. So you can do more strenuous exercise here. I do recommend if you have anxiety, don't do cardiovascular exercise because you're reinforcing the overproduction of adrenaline. Every single time you have a panic <laughs> attack, an anxiety attack, you're having a cardiovascular workout. And so to, to reinforce that is just causing more damage to the body. It's better to stay away from it until you can control your brain chemistry. Um, if you suffer depression, do more cardiovascular. You're not having enough epinephrine relief, release. I heard something tonight I'd like you to think about and just talk to me. Uh, they were talking about a man who was a composer, 
And he said he would work on it consciously for 45 minutes. And then he would go to sleep. And that is where he got all his creativity is in his sleep. I guess he got in his intellect. Because then he was able to compose much more easily. Yeah. Well, he composed easily because he just stored all the information. When you're going to sleep, your hippocampus is just storing oh, yeah. data. It's not new information. You don't, it's not learning. It's processing, like you're processing all the information. Mm -hmm. So apparently he set up a pattern where he was process storing information to usable memory. Mm -hmm. I don't think the <laughs> sleep caused his insula to fire. That doesn't make sense to me, uh, knowing brain function. What I think is what happened is, though, he's storing the information. That's a lot of times, too, why people fall asleep. Sometimes people are avoiding, but some people just now have to, I've just uh, given them so much information, their brain wants to sleep so it can store it. Because, again, we don't sleep to rest our body. Our bodies don't need sleep. Our brains need sleep or they become disorganized. The hippocampus is organizing the brain. The, the, all the memories from that day into the file systems they go to. So he probably accessed a certain memory file bank for him mm -hmm. that became a creative fire file bank when he woke up. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure. You'd have to have a brain scan on him to know for sure. But yeah. Yeah. But he when, when you for when 15 said, hours, he said it. Wow. Sometimes. That's a, that just seems really, strange. that's a lot. That's a, yeah. that's, that's way a lot. Yeah. But no, and I'll focus, when I focus on something really hard, I want to sleep after because my brain wants to store that information because it just got a ton of new information, so it wants to store it. So when we're concentrating really hard, that can happen. Okay, so again, phase two is consciously engaged with thoughts, feelings, emotions, um, sense of self, and um, be able to enter and maintain a centered state at will. So we're shrinking the amygdala to break the cycle. I recommend three times a day for 20 minutes if you have an enlarged amygdala. So if you're in a lot of states of suffering, three times a day. Um, I, right before sleep is important because, again, how your hippocampus is storing information is going to depend on that. Um, I recommend when you first wake up because, um, again, that's an important time for the hippocampus as well. Last 20 minutes before you go to sleep, first 20 minutes when you wake up are critical. Um, and then sometime middle of the day. If you don't have a high fight or flight response, um, once a day is plenty. Yeah. So go back to the beginning of what that was about. Was it the end of the day? Uh, that's if you have an enlarged amygdala to do, to do practices, phase two practices, okay. three times a day. You only want to do phase one if you can't do the phase two or if you're in a high triggered state. Your real focus is phase two. You want to break this cycle, right? And then next week, we made it. So Science behind miraculous things. So, 20, so well, I'm kind of in phase one right now, but 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night, one at some point in the day, 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I say um, part of phase one in the review of phase one is um, – practice doing phase two practices because we never want to stop at phase one in a practice but the real part of phase one is is really getting it in our heads right you're still doing phase two practices but you we're really getting it in our heads that no this might how i feel right now is a chemical as so the conditions uh, it doesn't matter what the conditions are and this is the this is the thing i have the most conversations about <laughs> is people saying well but this happened well, yeah, it's still a chemical. It's still a chemical. And you don't have to feel that way. We don't have to feel that way. And we tend to think feeling certain in, in feelings are inherent to certain situations. I mean, that's what drives confirmation bias. So um, just shrinking the amygdala. That's all we care about. So those practices three times a day to shrink the amygdala. So are you saying do phase one and phase two practices mm -hmm. three times a day? So yes. like a little bit of phase one, a little bit of phase yeah, if you need phase one. The most important thing is phase two. So if you try to do a phase two practice and can't, laughing, another one I, I have is like um, putting on music that makes you want to dance and sing, right? If I'm triggered, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to want that. When I'm, when I'm in a triggered state, I'm going to want meditation music, right? When I'm not, when I'm just having a day where I'm not hi highly triggered, I'm going to want 80s alternative. 
It's gonna make me happy. And I'm gonna sing and dance. I have that. My my alarm is connected to Spotify. And I have all my favorite songs. All the songs that make me want to dance on uh, the alarm that goes off in the morning. It turns on Spotify to all my favorite songs first thing in the morning. Now, why did you mention that those, you know, first thing in the morning and going to hippo bed are so, like, We want to do, because the hippocampus, so, so think of it this way. If, and if anybody has to go. I know your rights here, go. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, sorry I went over. But. No, thank you. I'm gonna look everything up. Awesome, and awesome. I'm sure I'll see you all again. Yeah, and like I said, the Inspired Evolution Project, <laughs> uh, the website. If you pull it up on your phone, you can save yeah. it to your home screen. You'll get updated when I post oh, articles. Cool. But um, the Inspired Evolution Project meetup has all the phases. It tells you what phase each yeah. group is, so that helps. Yeah. No, I am really uh, excited. I just want to say, I I'm more comfortable. Just doing phase one right now. Yeah. Well, no, you need to do the phase two practices though. Part of phase because if you just do phase one, you're doing what you've done your whole life. So, because even in mythology, you're doing a phase three mm -hmm. practice. So okay. stay in phase one, five, and I'm and working five. on understanding that how I'm feeling is a byproduct of chemical. You want to stay in that, mm -hmm. but make sure you you still keep doing your other practices. Okay, like I remember last time I came, like observing, being mm -hmm. mindful. Yeah, that's so phase two. That's phase two. So just do that stuff, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Body um, scans. Body scans are good. Yeah. Um, so 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 what's happening with the hippocampus? So what are hippocampus? Of course, its job is to assign memories, right? So if you start thinking insula versus amygdala, and the storing of information. So if you're going to sleep in a triggered state, ruminating, wheels turning, monkey mind. Your brain is saying, oh, I was, a, I was being chased by a tiger all day. So it's filing everything to the amygdala. Threat, 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 threat. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have nightmares and all of that, yeah. because the brain feels like it was under threat all day. That's... If in the last 20 minutes before we go to sleep, we convince the brain that we are safe and well, and not only that, but take it to the level of centered, then the brain will store information to the insula. So one of the advanced things in this is the fact that after we move through the early practices, as we get into like phase three and four, we're <laughs> actually growing the insula on the right side of the brain, which shrinks the amygdala further and eventually stops it firing, which is where we move out so of a primal state. Because that's, that's the state I can remember, that ruminating worry, mm -hmm. anxious stress. And so the brain, the brain thinks you're just being chased by a tiger all the time. Yeah. So it's just making that amygdala grow and grow and grow because it's storing all the information there. So the last 20 minutes. And the nightmares and all that mm -hmm. stuff you suffer from. And then, and then you wake the, up from, triggered. Yeah, you do. You wake up in a hyperactive state, right? Mm -hmm. So like uh, on edge almost. When the yeah. off, you are on edge already. Like, yeah. And yeah. the pharmaceutical approach has been, you know, ambient or like they give right. you a sleep aid, which isn't really fixing the root of the problem. No. It's and a, for me, and for me, that was like, I... <laughs> I had a headache. My granddaughter went to get me some ibuprofen and she got ibuprofen PM. Oh, I didn't know it. And I took that. I was messed up for the whole next day because I don't take anything. And so my body reacted really badly to it. But so and then the first 20 minutes of the, the, the day, you're setting up the same thing, the tone. And if you're not triggering the insula, you're not going to be motivated. So motivation comes from the insula. And, and your willpower and everything is going to come by triggering that prefrontal cortex and insula, which we will we get to. So I advance the practices. For right now, I tell people do phase two. But uh, really, a phase three practice right before we go to sleep is the best. And I'll get into those next week yeah. at the that Science Beyond Miraculous right. Healing. Yeah, because I did a lot of work <laughs> with meditation, which changed my life and did more for me than any pharmaceutical ever did. Mm -hmm. um, was, advanced, was practicing and learning more advanced. Meditation, getting better and better at it, um, and um, I would do it before I went to bed mm -hmm. when I woke up in the morning. Yeah, and so that's kind of, I think, kind of connects to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and so um, yeah, as we advance the practices, um, there's a lot uh, in the next level. What we do after we get out of these states of just triggering the prefrontal cortex. I mean, that information's out there already but this ability to actually grow the insula is the big the big piece so i think you'll like it 